for the ENFJ who wants to go out but their partner doesn't. That's completely understandable. It's your brain, your mind, the way your psyche works is activating your nervous system because if you do something your partner doesn't want to do, it, your nervous system gets triggered. And you have the right and the duty to honor your preferences and do the things that are important to you because otherwise that's going to come out negatively in your relationship. Following up from the short that I posted about how if you have ENFJ preferences and you happen to be with an introverted partner where you want to do things together but they don't feel like doing it, I said do it yourself, just go, right? Because ENFJs have this tendency to discard their own needs and to maintain harmony and maintaining harmony sometimes looks like we'll do what you want to do. I thought I wanted to get a little bit deeper into this both from a type perspective but also from a relationship perspective because there is really a lot to unpack here. If we start with the extroversion piece, if you have an E at the front of your type code it doesn't mean you're necessarily loud or super outgoing or super obnoxious or can't shut up or talk all the time or need to be in crowds all the time or need to be in groups all the time. What Jung had intended for this attitude, I believe, to convey is that your psychic energy, your libido, as he calls it, your psychic libido, your attention, is naturally outward directed. Even like looking at a child, when you put a new toy in front of the child, somebody with extroversion preferences is going to look at it, touch it, play with it, refer to it. So extroverted children are more likely to interact with the actual thing outside themselves. Children with introversion preferences are more likely to maybe sit back a little bit and also be curious about it. But then the energy goes towards what does this mean for me? How do I think about it? How do I feel about it? Where have I seen it before? What could I do with it? Like the attention is inward, right? So from that follows a bunch of behaviors that make it possible to to recognize somebody with extroversion or introversion preferences because when you're more likely to engage with something outside of yourself then yes you are more likely to maybe talk about it as well and you're more likely to be actively engaged with it as well. I just want to say that not all extroverts are obnoxious a-holes. What is true about people with extroversion preferences also though is at the biological level the neurons and the particular wiring in our brain we need more stimulation to register stimulation. Our brains and the neurotransmitters the way that they work they need more stimulation than the brain of somebody with introversion preferences. The threshold of activation of interest is higher for extroverts, so it takes more to get us to yay. Where, you know, with introversion preferences may already be stimulated while the person with extroversion preferences is bored. We haven't reached that threshold of interest activation. Salience is also what it's called. Something isn't quite salience yet, or we need more stuff in order for our brains to wake up and say, who interest, right? That means that people with extroversion preferences are more likely to want to go out and are more likely to have interactions and are more likely to pay attention to all sorts of things in the outside of them. Whereas somebody with introversion preferences more easily gets overwhelmed next to an extroverted person, right? Obviously there is a bunch of individual differences as well. Not all people with introversion preferences are the same. Not all people with extroversion preferences are the same. There is a combination of factors that are play it's important also for me to acknowledge that none is better or worse. They're just different. In a romantic relationship situation, especially if you are the female ENFJ and then with a male introverted thinking type, probably because they are quite attractive to us because of a host of other reasons. The extroversion is only part of it. The extroversion is our desire to interact with other people and new environments and have experiences and go out and do things to stimulate our intuition as well. And then the extroverted feeling portion of it. So our dominant function, the thing that our brains can't not do is about connecting and relating to someone else. We are more likely to put our needs on the back burner because our brain literally tells us, no, they're important. The relationship, the connection has to be saved. And if we disagree with them or if we try and make them do something that they are then unhappy about, that triggers us, right? That's a flag. The extroverted feeling pathways react in a way that signal danger, as in the harmony is threatened, the relationship is potentially threatened, so you better do to whatever they want to keep yourself safe. And keeping ourselves safe from the extroverted feeling perspective means, okay, what we want is causing an upset, so we better not want it. And that is like the surface psychological level of especially also the female component that comes into it because gender, right, if we're going back to the human model that we're thinking about, the biopsychosocial, the biology is with the extroversion piece that we need more stimulation than our introverted partner. The psychocognitive piece is that we want to please others. 
but we also have needs of our own. So reconciling that is where the issue comes in then to build the relationships that we actually want and the true connection that we actually want. And then the social aspect is that we are conditioned often, female ENFJs, especially of my generation, we have been conditioned and culturally sold this idea of our male counterparts' needs are more important than our own anyway. So it plays into the extroverted feeling bit. But then also we never learned and we weren't really taught how to assert ourselves, how to healthily describe our boundaries, how to stand up for ourselves really in a way that is not perceived as threatening by our own nervous systems, but also that is received as not threatening or not overstepping any bounds by our male partners and even the female counterparts, because the women in our foregoing generations have obviously been taught the same and they've had it even harder, right? The society is moving towards a more egalitarian approach, but our psyches still have to catch up with it because our parents' generation wasn't quite there and they perpetuated those teachings by instilling certain values in us. So do you see how complex that little interaction between an extroverted female, an EFJ, it doesn't even have to be ENFJ, it could be an ESFJ as well, and an introverted thinking male or otherwise partner could be. So a lot of issues come to bear. I wanted to highlight that this is the kind of situation or this is the kind of context where personality type knowledge and awareness has really helped me have a relationship that works for me and build a relationship that works for me because it just plays out in so many different arenas. My husband has INTP preferences and he's never been happy going to big events with me. And again, not saying that all INTPs don't want to go out, but for on the relationship level, I'm just giving myself as an example, the extroversion means I need stimulation not to be bored. The feeling means I don't want to hurt my partner. I want him to feel included and to be included and to do things together because his needs are very important to me. And there is only so long that I can play that game. That's the other piece. So there are the extroversion and the extroverted feeling function. What I said earlier about how to resolve the inner conflict, there eventually comes a point where, and tell me if you can resonate, where you say, all right, I've put my needs on the back burner for so long, they're going to have to come out now in some way or another. And what personality type awareness has helped me do is find those middle grounds or find those compromises or take steps to assert my needs and feel good about living them and feel good about verbalizing them and then feel good about doing things that I want to do even though he's not with me. That is knowledge of personality type and being conscious and th those approaches, doing it in a cognitively aware and mindful way has allowed me to not have it all bubble over and then I start shouting and throwing stuff at the wall that doesn't belong there because I think that also sometimes happens in relationships when somebody feels like they've been neglected for lack of a better word for too long right everybody has their line everybody has their amount of patience and then eventually it just gets too much so this is where I like the comparison of psychodynamics to thermodynamics because your unconscious plays an important part and you have to look at those parts that you're not consciously aware of because they will out much like thermodynamics when you bring a pot of water to a boil there is churning happening under the surface and eventually it bubbles. So in relationships, ideally, we don't want to get to the bubbling over part. We want to be mindful of, hey, the temperature is rising here. Can we take a look at that now and regulate and make sure that stuff doesn't spill over because then it's uncontrolled and other types of conflicts or that's when you say something that you regret because that's then psychological, like type speaking, that's when you're in the grip of your inferior functions, of the shadow functions, that then you don't know. You, they just have to come out because you can't keep them in. But they're potentially detrimental to the actual relationship that you want to solve. So, yeah, the knowledge of, okay, these are my needs, and then these are your needs, and the knowledge of personality type, applying that to my own marriage has been super helpful from the beginning. So I've known about type for a while, but then I got properly licensed and really started reading about it and learning about it in 2010 and got some more certifications in 2012. And I'm on record as saying that type saved my marriage because for the longest time, the relationship, we've had the issues and I've tried to fix them and we've tried to fix them in a myriad of different ways. But it wasn't until I looked at our type preferences side by side that it was really, it became really clear to me, he's not doing it on purpose. Like he's not doing it to be difficult. He's not doing anything to piss me off. It's just that this is how he's wired. And strangely, that gave me permission to be who I was 
as well. If you are an ENFJ out there in a relationship where you feel like oh, it's difficult or it's challenging or you have different ideas about it, there's a whole other chapter where we can challenge all those ideas of why do you even think you have to do everything with your one partner, which is going back to the whole mononormative idea of it's, if he's the one, then he has to fulfill all your needs and he is, you know, the one person that you can rely on, da da da. That's a whole other subject. But personality wise speaking, for your own growth and development, being with somebody who has different preferences from you is an invitation for growth. And I've said from the very beginning that as frustrating as it was, we have a good handle on, on many things now, but as frustrating as it was at the beginning, this person who is so very different from me, we only have the intuiting in common and his intuiting is extroverted and mine is introverted. So we really are quite opposite the way that our brains work. He is still the person that I learn the most from and he is still the person that helps me grow so much because his dominant is my inferior and vice versa. And so we really complement one another quite nicely and yeah, have settled into conversations that are just helpful and loving and supportive of who we are as individuals. So again, if you're an ENFJ in a relationship where you wonder, are we too different? It's too hard, it shouldn't be this hard. Sure, it shouldn't be super hard, like both parties should be at the table to be willing to learn and talk about things. But also in this friction, lies opportunity. Okay, and I think I'm going to leave it there. I just wanted to say again to wrap up for the ENFJ who wants to go out but their partner doesn't. That's completely understandable. It's your brain, your mind, the way your psyche works is activating your nervous system because if you do something your partner doesn't want to do, it, your nervous system gets triggered. And you have the right and the duty to honor your preferences and do the things that are important to you because otherwise that's going to come out negatively in your relationship. You are guided by the desire for authentic, loving, true connection. And you have to show up as your whole self so that connection is on solid ground. Don't hold back. Bring your whole self to that relationship. And then you'll know when it works out, it's because you brought your whole self to it and your whole self is okay and your needs are okay and they are valid. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to talking more about all of that in future videos. Let me know what you think.